Welcome. My name is Darlene Switzer Foster, and I'm chapter president for the Calgary chapter of Weizmann Canada. We're very pleased this morning to have over 100 res registrants with us from across Western Canada and around the world for today's special presentation titled The Energy Shift, The Science and Business of Renewable Energy. For those of you unfamiliar with Weizmann, the Institute has an over 70 year history at the forefront of scientific discovery. Since 1964, Weizmann Canada has been helping to support these critical discoveries. Part of Weizmann's reputation is built by challenging current thinking, which has led to many life-changing breakthroughs. Recently, Weizmann ranked eighth in the world for research quality in the prestigious Leiden University ranking. The only non-American institute to rank in the top eight among the likes of Harvard, Princeton, and MIT. One thing the current pandemic has taught us is that science is the key to a better tomorrow for all of humanity because science knows no borders. Weizmann research transcends borders and reaches us in Canada every day. Since 2019, Weizmann has co-published over 80 studies with more than 30 Canadian organizations including 33 studies with eight organizations in Western Canada on topics ranging from the environment to therapeutic discoveries. Encouraging dialogue and collaboration to promote new discoveries is what Weizmann is all about, which is why we're so very pleased to welcome you here today. I'd now like to introduce my fellow Weizmann Canada Calgary chapter member, Stan Magidson. Uh, Stan will be moderating today's panel discussion. Stan's the chair and CEO of the Alberta Securities Commission. Before joining the ASC in July 2016, he was president and CEO, CEO and director of the Institute of Corporate Directors and chair of the Global Network of Director Institutes. Prior to that, Stan was a partner for 21 years with a national law firm in the Business Law Group where he advised corporate issuers, investors, financial intermediaries, and boards of directors across the country on securities law, corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, and corporate governance matters. Stan currently sits on the International Board of the Weizmann Institute of Science and the National Board of Weizmann Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stan Magidson. Morning, Stan. Well, good morning, Darlene, and, and thanks so much for that very kind introduction. Um, like Darlene, I, I'm very uh, pleased to welcome you all here today. And before we get into our, our presentations, uh, I would just like to highlight a, a couple of housekeeping points so you'll get a sense of how, how the, the session will flow today. Uh, first of all, we're going to begin with 10-minute uh, presentations um, by each of our panelists. And um, after that, we will then have a, a Q&A session that will start at approximately uh, 8.40 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, from now until then, I would really encourage you all, please, to uh, type any questions that you may have into the Zoom chat uh, as we go through each of the presentations. Uh, we'll come back to those questions during that 20-minute Q&A at the end. Uh, we promise to finish up by 9 a.m. so that uh, you can carry on with the rest of your day. Now, uh, to frame the morning a little bit, while the topic of clean energy is incredibly broad and clearly of great interest globally, in the interest of time today, uh, in the interest of time for today's event, we really are going to be focusing on a couple of select topics, namely uh, bioenergy and its related carbon capture and storage. We're also going to hear a lot about batteries and, and, and their storage. And we're also going to hear a fair bit about wind and solar power. Depending on where the conversation goes, we'll see about the possibility of future panel sessions to focus on other topics of interest. Now, first up, 
we'll have uh, Professor Mark Strauss from the University of Calgary's Department of Geoscience, who will be focusing on bioenergy and its related carbon capture and storage. Rather than read uh, Mark's bio to you, which was in the invitation, we, we, we asked him to provide his top three achievements as it relates to his presentation today. And here's what he said. First, he discovered a previously overlooked bacterium, a bacterium that makes one third of all of the air on earth. Secondly, he scaled up and commercialized new technology for wastewater treatment, reducing carbon dioxide emissions by tons per day worldwide. And he co-founded Synergia Biotech. Synergia has created the world's first, in quotes, green blue. And maybe he can explain that a bit better than I could. Now, I don't think many of us can say that we've discovered a bacterium, we've made wastewater treatment more effective globally, or we created a new environmentally friendly pigment. An impressive list indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Mark Strauss. Good morning, uh, everybody. I hope you can hear me and see me. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor and privilege to be here today and, um, and kick, kick off this session as the first speaker. So I am going to set the scene with, um, with a little graph um, that I'll share here. This is what, uh, what sparked the, um, the energy transition where we find ourselves in today. So this is the science that shows that um, the CO2 concentration in our air on Earth has increased so much during recent years. You see that uh, you know humans are only humans like us are only on this planet for two hundred thousand years, and we've never seen this before. Um, CO two concentrations have risen more than it takes to create an ice age, as you can see. And and when this continues for ten more years, ten more years, um, like like today, we will find ourselves. In the back in the middle Miocene, which is 15 million years ago, when um, the, the the CO2 was the same as as what it will be in 2035, plus three degrees Celsius and 17 meters of sea level rise. Right, that's a really grim situation, um, and and that's what makes many people worried, and uh, and what has uh, driven governments to pledge that we should you know, leave carbon behind and, and do net zero. Now, what does net zero mean? What, it, what would it look like? Uh, how can we, can we do that? There's a couple of technologies that are, um, that are floating around and I'll just share them with you as I'm the first speaker here to give a bit of an overview. So what people have been looking for for decades is um, something like biofuels. So what happens with biofuels is plants take the CO2 from the air, and then we convert them into a fuel, and the fuel gets burned and the CO2 gets back into the air, right? That's, that's net zero. There's no new CO2 getting added. Um, another one is more recent, called uh, sometimes called direct air capture, where you um, kind of replace the plants with uh, factories, with giant um, CO2 cap capture machines that take the CO2 from the air, then use renewable electricity, to, co to convert the CO2 to fuel, and uh, then again, burn the fuel and put it back, so net, net zero. Something that has uh, come up recently is called blue hydrogen, where you um, take natural gas from the ground, um, like we do today, but then um, you, what you do is you, um, you decarbonize it, which means that you convert the natural gas to hydrogen and CO2, and the hydrogen you burn in your cars, you would new, need new cars for that. And then um, the CO2 um, gets sequestered, and that means it gets stored deep below the ground uh, and, uh, and doesn't go back, in, it doesn't go into the air. So again, could be uh, net zero. It also means you know, changing our houses, getting rid of our, our natural gas-fired furnaces, 
Um, but all those things, if I were an investor, I wouldn't bet on them. What I would bet my money on is, is renewable energy, creating you know um, carbon-free electricity from um, from solar and wind, and that's also a major topic today. Just because the economics is there, the traction is there, and it would also bring a lot of other benefits than only um, um, you know getting rid of of CO two. Unfortunately, all those things, according to the global modelers um, and the global science, will not be enough to prevent uh, climate disaster. And you know, when you find yourselves in the forest fires, we find ourselves, or the smoke of forest fires, we find ourselves today in Alberta. It's not hard to believe when you look at the graph I just showed. It's not hard to believe that things are running out of control faster than uh, than net zero can help us with. So, what people have proposed, we need technologies that actually take the CO2 from the air and not put it back, um, but put it, for example, below the ground. And this is um, the, the most feasible or let's say impact, likely impactful of all those technologies is called um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or sequestration. So it's, it looks like biofuels. Um, you, start, you start out with plants and then you burn the plants, but you don't burn them as a fuel in a car, you burn them in a, in a power plant. So you have this, this um, stack gas or off gas with all the CO2, and instead of just venting it into the air, you put it below the ground. And this way you actually take the CO2 from the air and, uh, and reduce the, uh, you know, the actual CO2 concentration, bringing back the climates we know from our uh, well, we don't even know it anymore, right? Our generation already grew up in a in a in a in a changed climate. But that's something that's more similar to when we were young. Um, now, this is a really controversial thing, and uh, because it is clear that um, that bioenergy with carbon capture and storage would take a lot of land, and it would also cost a fantastic amount of money. And that's what my uh, what, what research I was involved in and, and leading at the University of Calgary was investigating. Can we find ways to do that more um, cost effectively? Because you know at this moment it's just too expensive to credibly achieve, and with less land use. Because at this moment, you know we would compromise food production. Uh, forget it. Um, and so what we what, what what my team did is we we looked at um, algae instead of plants because you can grow algae uh, in theory very um, in a very um, much more dense way so that you need less land and hopefully also more cost-effective way. So we created a lot of innovations and I'm just gonna share my uh, screen for, um, for a few minutes to, to show you uh, an example of those innovations. Let's see. Yeah. So this is an uh, alkaline soda lake in, uh, in BC uh, above Kamloops where currently a lot of forest fires are raging. Um, and um, this, um, this is a lake that naturally has a very high pH and naturally it actually captures CO2 from the air because it's so alkaline. And in the geological past, these lakes have actually captured a significant part of the carbon in the atmosphere at one time, at times when, the, when, the, um, when there's a lot of volcanic activity and a lot of these lakes are created. Um, so in these lake, lakes live algae, and when you look at the Google Earth image, um, you see you know, that these lakes are quite greenish. And these algae, are, they're actually cyanobacteria, uh, prosper in those lakes. They have fantastic rates of CO2 conversion. And so what my team did, among other innovations, is take this, uh, this lake chemistry and its, its microbes and put it into um, initially in the lab and later in uh, test installations outside in Alberta. We tried, can we really achieve something that looks like um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage? And technically this, uh, this worked really, really well. And in terms of realizing cost reductions, it worked really, really well. So we, we can do this much cheaper than was possible before, just you know, with a few years of research, but in terms of land use, it wasn't so successful. And um, when you think about, um, you know, trying to achieve bioenergy with carbon capture and storage with this, probably not such a good idea, probably not feasible. So in that sense, our innovations fell short and I've become quite pessimistic that 
more could be possible to uh, get this in the right direction. If you want to know what kind of advances would be ne necessary, it's mainly in the realm of um, a plastic uh, molding and manufacturing, because that's the major cost of the technology. But <clears throat> what we also discovered is that actually uh, we can produce a really nice blue color from, this, um, from these cyanobacteria that live in these alkaline lakes much better than what's pre presently on the market and also at much, much lower cost. So when you think about um, blue as a pigment in food, um, it's, a, it's a really hard one. Um, there's, there's a synthetic colorant, which is, you know, major health problem. So um, not um, people want to get rid of it. So it's a, it's a half a billion market, we estimate, if you can, you know, produce natural blue at a, at a, at a good cost. So really important part of the uh, energy transition, I would say, as an example, because we would need that, like what is happening now is everything in industry has to change. Every process has to become carbon um, negative or carbon neutral, at least. This brings major economic benefits overall, and those benefits are really important to finance the energy transition, right? When you think about a city like Calgary, if you could you know, realize and capture this market locally, you would bring major economic um, benefits to this region. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot and what's really, really important for countries and cities and regions to kind of look very carefully at where the money is coming from today and where it needs or could come from tomorrow because it might not be the same. All right, that finishes my presentation. I got 10 minutes. These are my 10 minutes and I look forward to the presentations of the other panelists. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mark. I, I'm sure that will inspire some uh, questions and some further curiosity. So hopefully we can get back to you in the Q&A. Um, now up, we'll have uh, Dr. Michal Leskis um, from the Weizmann Institute of Science's Department of Molecular Chemistry and material science to focus on advancements in new battery technologies and storage. Michal's recent research focuses on identifying methods to improve the performance and life cycle of rechargeable batteries, an important part of clean technology. Her most recent findings address the solid electrolyte interface layer, or referred to as SEI, a thin film which occurs upon the first charging of the battery and is the most important factor affecting both safety, lifespan, safety and lifespan of the battery. This layer protects the battery from losing charge and helps it work more, more efficiently. Most recently, Dr. Leskis developed methods to identify the components of this critical layer and designed a new kind of SEI, which can improve the battery's charging power and lifespan. Energy storage is vital to any sustainability energy approach. Michal's work is also a very significant component in addressing our future global energy needs. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Dr. Michal Leskis. Hi, um, thank you very much, Stan, for the introduction, and thank you very much, uh, very much, uh, Weizmann Canada, for the invitation to participate here. I'm very uh, happy to do that and happy to join the, the, the panel. So let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a chemist, so what I do and what I like to do and what fascinates me is to understand how materials a function, so how exactly a certain material, um, depending on what elements are making this material and how these elements are arranged in space, so how uh, this specific composition and specific structure give the material its functionality. So for example, you can take a certain material um, that would look like table salt, but if you actually put it and let it absorb sunlight, it will convert the light into electricity. And the same way you can take a material that by eye 
looks exactly like table salt and you can uh, transfer electricity through it and it will convert it into a chemical reaction. So as a chemist, what fascinates me is to understand how the choice of atoms and how they interact with each other, how that gives the material its specific function. And what I chose to uh, do it in, in, uh, in my career path, so I started as a PhD student here at Weizmann Institute. Uh, and then following, following my PhD, I went to the University of Cambridge in the UK. Um, and there I got fascinated with the world of uh, rechargeable batteries, specifically lithium ion batteries. And batteries are extremely important, as was already mentioned. Um, energy storage plays a key role in the transition towards using uh, renewable If we want to, sorry, I froze for a second. So if we want to be able to uh, use solar energy or energy coming from the wind, these are tran transient sources. So we have to be able to somehow convert them in, into electricity and store them in a way that can, they can be uh, transportable and be used uh, at times that we don't have sun at night or in places that we don't have wind. So we have to have an efficient way to utilize these sustainable energy resources. And one of the leading way to do that would be the rechargeable battery. Now, as you all know, you have uh, your own batteries powering your cell phones and your laptops. And you know that these batteries are lasting, uh, you know, when you buy them, you can use them for a whole day. And the more you use them, you have to charge them more and more often. So how can these tiny batteries that are powering our uh, electronic devices and of course change the way that we live today, how can these batteries be the, um, uh, suitable for much more uh, demanding applications? So for powering uh, cars or for storing energy for grid application, for leveling the, the way electricity is distributed. So the answer is that it's a very challenging task and there are many aspects that we have to uh, improve these batteries in order to make them suitable to be used for energy storage uh, systems in a large scale. So I will not go into all of the different aspects, but I will just mention a few of the aspects that we have to improve in these uh, batteries. So one of them, uh, which is of course very important if you want to put a battery in a car, uh, is related to safety. So uh, the reason that batteries uh, sometimes in very rare occasion can catch fire, for example, is that you can have a short circuit inside the battery that would release a lot of heat. And the battery is partly made of uh, organic solvents and these solvents are flammable. So once you have this uh, uh, instantaneous release of heat, you can have a fire in a battery. And of course, that's not acceptable if you wanna have a battery uh, in a car. So one of the ways that uh, scientists like me and many others and engineers uh, in academia and in industry are working on is to improve the safety of these battery cells. And this can be done, for example, by moving from liquid elect liquid based system where you have organic solvents to solids. So the way to do that would be to fundamentally understand how can a solid material replace a liquid material and get the same uh, performance in a battery cell. Another aspect that we would like to improve is the amount of energy you can store in a battery cell. So that would require development of new uh, electrode material, new materials that go into the battery and that can store more charge per uh, amount of material, per weight. So that uh, involves uh, um, uh, designing new materials and understanding how these material functioning inside a battery cell. Uh, the last aspect I will mention is related to the uh, cost and um, and production of the battery. So we would like to be able to have battery materials that are um, um, uh, relatively cheap, available, non-toxic, uh, that do not depend on which uh, continent you're from, but are easily available. And we would like to be able to recycle them. So currently there is hardly any recycling uh, of battery cell. And of course, if we are already seeing the transition of using battery cells in uh, electric vehicles. So we would have to be able to find a way to also recycle these materials uh, to reduce the cost and making this process uh, greener towards in the long term. And uh, finally, the last aspect, which is the one that we are most focused on uh, in the research in my group here at Weizmann, is related to the lifetime of the battery cell. I started from mentioning the uh, battery cells that we have in our uh, cell phones. And I'm sure you all know that you have to charge your cell phones more and more often as you use them. And the reason for that comes from the fact that um, the materials that are uh, making the battery uh, storing energy are very reactive materials. 
So except for the reaction, the chemical reaction that is taking place that is providing electricity, they also react in many, many other ways in ways that it, we don't want because it consumes part of the energy uh, from the battery cell. So this is well known and has been well known since the invention of the lithium ion battery, but it is not really understood what are these reactions. And more, more important than that, it's not really understood or not really known uh, how you can prevent these reactions from taking place. So ideally you would like to buy your battery and have the same amount of energy uh, the day you bought it a few years later. So we have to be able to understand what are these side reactions that are taking place inside the battery cell that uh, are consuming uh, the energy from the battery. So this is what we do in my group. So I joined a Weizmann Institute after my postdoc and opened my research group six years ago. And what we are doing is to develop new methods that will uh, allow us to probe these side reactions. So currently, uh, with the current methodologies that we have, the analytical tools that chemists and engineers have, we cannot look inside a battery cell and follow these reactions. So the way that we do it in my group is to use a technique that is very similar to MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And the same way that you would use MRI in order to take a look inside our body without uh, hurting the body and keeping us intact, we can use this technique MRI uh, to probe what is happening inside the battery, uh, battery cell and what, how are the materials changing without affecting the process itself. But MRI, as you know, it doesn't allow, uh, we don't uh, directly look at atoms or molecules, we see tissues uh, in an MRI experiment. So what we have to do and what we do is to increase uh, the ability of MRI uh, and push it to a way that you can actually look at layers of, uh, of atom and molecules inside a battery cell. So we have to increase the sensitivity of an MRI in order to do that. And what we were able to do in the past few years is to increase the sensitivity so much that we can actually start detecting these reactions that are taking place in the battery cell and understand how they consume the energy and um, make the energy that of, the, of the cell deteriorate uh, with time. So once we understand that, we can start to think of ways to prevent these reactions from taking place and designing materials that will be more robust and will have longer lifetime in, in the battery cell. So in the past few years, in collaboration with other research groups in, here in Israel, we were able to identify why one type of treatment to the surface of the electrodes that are used in a battery cell that allows them to perform uh, uh, much, free, much more freely without react, uh, reacting uh, in uh, these processes that are consuming energy um, uh, for longer time scales. So of course, this is all in a lab scale. We are uh, not industry, we are uh, doing basic research, but some of these ideas can be the source of uh, other of a uh, source of materials that can be then implemented uh, in actual battery cells and may have a chance to improve the lifetime and performance of these battery cells. So with this, uh, I will end. I hope making chemistry without uh, slides um, uh, was, uh, was uh, working, but well, 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 thank, thank you, Michal. I can tell you, you certainly charged my battery there. So hopefully, uh, uh, similarly, uh, the audience uh, had a sense of your enthusiasm for uh, the work that you're doing and the important research being conducted at the Weizmann Institute. Um, um, at this time, I would just like to uh, provide a reminder to the audience uh, we really do want to uh, give you some feedback on what your curiosity is. So please, please do uh, use the Zoom chat to uh, provide questions to us so that we can address those in the Q&A. Um, our final panelist today is going to be uh, Dan Balaban, who's co-founder, president, and CEO of Greengate Power, uh, a leading Canadian energy, uh, renewable energy company uh, uh, and he'll be addressing advancements in, in wind and solar energy. Some of um, uh, Dan's achievements are that uh, he was involved in the development of, of over one uh, gigawatt of operating and in construction uh, renewable energy projects in Canada, including the country's largest uh, wind and solar energy projects, expected to produce enough 
renewable energy to power more than 400,000 homes um, uh, through Green Greengate, uh, involved in signing Amazon as the first uh, renewable power purchase agreement uh, participant in Canada. And uh, he has served uh, for nine years on the board of the Pembina Institute, which is a leading Canadian environmental think tank. Um, so Dan rounds out our panel this morning quite nicely, I think, by speaking to the actual successful application of renewable energy in the marketplace. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dan Balaban. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so, you know, so I'll spend a bit of time, um, you know, talking about, um, you know, energy transition, um, trying to frame the energy transition, you know, what I see as a, uh, an unnecessarily polarized discussion going on right now, uh, particularly uh, here in Alberta, which is a, uh, you know, oil producing region of the world. Uh, you know, we live in, in times of unprecedented energy demand. Demand uh, for energy is continuing to grow at a phenomenal rate, you know, but the threat of human caused climate change is forcing us to explore new ways of producing the energy we in the developing world need. Um, you know, the resulting narrative from this tension pits, uh, you know, renewable energy against fossil fuels, you know, demanding that we choose a side. You know, I believe that this uh, narrative is false, uh, unproductive and unnecessarily polarized. Um, you know, instead, I think I need, we need to think about this issue for what it is, it's a transition. Uh, it's a transition from burning molecules as an energy source you know, like wood, coal, oil, and gas, uh, to producing and transmitting clean electrons via renewables like wind and solar. Um, but like all beneficial transitions, it will not and cannot occur overnight. Um, you know, so a little bit about me. Uh, I was raised in Calgary, Alberta, uh, Canada's energy capital. I've been interested in energy uh, my entire life. Uh, you know, but growing up in Calgary at the doorstep of the uh, Canadian Rockies, you know, has given me an appreciation for nature, and uh, I've been interested in environmental issues uh, for a really long time. Um, I earned a degree in computer science from the University of Toronto. Uh, I started my career in uh, technology and oil and gas. Uh, my first entrepreneurial venture uh, was an oil and gas technology company that I started that was called Roughneck.ca. Uh, started at the age of 24. And uh, amongst other things, what we did is we helped oil and gas companies manage and report their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, and this, you know, did this in the early uh, 2000s. And this gave me early insight into the environmental challenges that I could see uh, oil and gas companies were starting to grapple with. Um, I had a successful exit uh, from Roughneck at the age of 30. And uh, I wanted my next venture to be something that was both you know, an exciting business challenge, you know, and one that could leave a positive uh, lasting environmental impact uh, in the world, you know, uh, ultimately guided by the Jewish principle of, you know, tikkun olam, or, you know, the idea of repairing the world. Um, you know, ultimately, I believe that uh, we're all here, um, you know, to make the world better in some way, you know, for some people that's applying skills in business, for some people it's applying it as an artist or a you know, community organizer. We all have um, our unique skills and talents and I believe we all have um, you know, a duty to, to make the world better. So with that, with no prior experience in power generation, I started Greengate Power uh, with my brother Jordan more than 14 years ago uh, with the goal of developing large scale renewable energy projects um, in the heart of oil country uh, in our home province of Alberta, Canada. Um, you know, it's been quite the challenge uh, and adventure so far, um, you know, but as a career entrepreneur, you know, I've learned, uh, you know, to expect the unexpected and uh, ultimately perseverance and belief in one's vision is key. Um, and we, you know, we've been successful in realizing our vision. Um, you know, so far we, as Stan mentioned in the introduction, you know, we've developed over one gigawatt of operating and in-construction renewable energy projects in Canada, uh, including the country's largest wind and solar energy projects, uh, you know, uh, generated investment of over $1.8 billion and expected to produce enough clean energy for more than 
400,000 homes. So, you know, something of a you know, pretty significant impact. Uh, you know, but I believe that all, you know, successfully developing precedent setting, you know, renewable energy projects in the heart of oil country, you know, gives me a unique um, perspective on the, uh, on the energy discussion. One that, you know, some of you may find surprising. Um, maybe let's start just brief, you know, not start, continue with a, uh, a brief uh, visioning exercise. So, you know, maybe everybody you know, close your eyes, um, you know, picture the year 2030 and, you know, picture how we produce and consume energy and, you know, not an ideal vision, but, you know, what do we realistically think the world's going to look like in 2030? Keep your eyes closed. And I, I just have a few questions, you know, in your vision, are there more electric vehicles on the road than there are today? Are there still gasoline powered vehicles on the road? Are there many more buildings with solar panels? Are we still burning fossil fuels to heat our homes? Okay, now uh, feel free to open your eyes. Um, I won't be able to take a poll today given the, uh, you know, the virtual environment that we're working within, but you know, I've asked these questions to you know, audiences in the past, and I found that most have answered yes to all those questions. And if you've answered yes to all those questions, sure, you know, that's, that points to a world that's much cleaner than it, than it is today, but it also points to a world where we're still gonna need fossil fuels uh, for the foreseeable future. So um, you know, something that is uh, important to consider when we're in this polarized energy discussion. You know, the modern world as we know it today, you know, thanks to an abundance of energy that's provided us to, you know, today by fossil fuels, you know, from the cars we drive to the way we heat our buildings to the way we power our lights, most of our energy today, at least, comes from fossil fuels, you know, in other words, molecules. You know, but there is undeniably, uh, you know, transition that's underway from, from fossil fuels to renewables, or, you know, as I would describe it, from molecules to clean electrons. Um, you know, the speed of this transition is hotly debated, but, you know, it certainly seems to be accelerating, uh, especially in a world that's gra grappling with, you know, increasing climate-related issues, you know, as we're seeing right now with the unprecedented heat waves and fires we're seeing here in Alberta, you know, but also in, uh, in a world that's trying to figure out how it wants to recover from a, you know, unprecedented global pandemic. You know, but the reality is today we can't simply shut off the taps to our fossil fuel resources for the sake of addressing climate change. It's not yet technically feasible to do so. Uh, for the time being, we, you know, we still need fossil fuels in the mix. You know, that said though, there, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the age of renewables has arrived and the coming decade will see profound changes to the way uh, in which we produce and consume our energy. You know, ultimately fossil fuels are being replaced by clean electrons as the world's primary source of energy. Um, you know, as I see it, there's three legs of the stool when it comes to the, you know, the net zero uh, energy system that is in the not too distant future. You know, first off is, uh, you know, generation of the energy itself from renewables. So, you know, generation of, you know, clean electrons, uh, you know, from wind, from solar, from geothermal, um, you know, and other um, renewable technologies. Um, you know, that's the furthest uh, along of the, you know, the legs of the stool, you know, but that's, um, you know, currently got some technical limitations. It's limited by intermittency. You know, wind energy produces when the wind's blowing, solar produces when the sun's shining, but what do you do when those conditions don't exist? Um, you know, that's where you've got some of these other pieces that are important. You've got, you know, electrification of transportation, uh, which is another uh, important piece. So again, replacing oil with you know, clean electrons is the primary source of energy that we're using in the world to, you know, power our vehicles. And if you want proof of that's coming, you know, Tesla, which uh, 10 years ago was, uh, was just an emerging company is now the most valuable automotive company in the world. You know, and then I think the last piece, which is critical and they're all related is uh, utility scale energy storage. The challenge that exists uh, with the electricity system today Michal can get into a lot more of the details than I can, but uh, is that we can't store energy 
on a utility scale. So electricity is matched in real time. So um, if we can introduce large scale energy storage, you know, through batteries and other energy storage technologies, we can store the wind and the solar energy uh, for later for when we need it most, and we can run truly a, you know, a net zero uh, energy system. Um, you know, uh, I think, you know, really what we're looking at is, uh, you know, is an entirely uh, new paradigm. Um, uh, you know, and I liken it to, uh, you know, an analog versus digital analogy. Uh, you know, traditionally, we produced energy uh, through mechanical means, right? So, you know, by burning molecules, um, you know, to, you know, to, uh, you know, to turn a, a, a turbine, you know, to create steam, to turn a turbine, to turn that mechanical energy into, into power. Uh, you know, same thing even with a, you know, with a wind turbine. Uh, you know, wind turbine is a big machine in the sky. And you turn the, you know, the energy in the wind into rotational energy and, uh, and create power. But solar and batteries in particular are a new paradigm. And I liken it to a digital paradigm. You know, you're producing and storing energy with no moving parts. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a digital system. And digital systems, uh, you know, provide for unprecedented uh, rates of cost reductions and potential efficiency improvements, um, you know, just like computers, you know, uh, you know, in 1969, we just celebrated the 52nd anniversary of sending humans to the moon uh, yesterday. In fact, you know, we sent humans to the moon with a computer that would have filled an entire office building. That was with, you know, what the computers were. And now, you know, we all carry that, you know, in the palm of our hand. Uh, you know, the same sort of phenomenon has been going on in renewable energy uh, for a long time. Uh, and that's why we're seeing global capital, uh, you know, rushing into renewable energy. You know, wind and solar are already attracting, uh, you know, the greatest share of investment in the world in terms of new power generation. And, uh, you know, the market share is expected to grow uh, pretty significantly. Um, you know, renewable energy delivers, you know, great stable long-term uh, returns for investors, but investors are also increasingly focused on ESG investing, environmental, social, and governance-based investing. You know, essentially investing to earn a return, but also, you know, do good in the process. Um, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, another reason that the capital is flowing into renewables is because of the tremendous cost reductions, uh, you know, that the industry is seeing. You know, for example, the cost of solar panels has dropped by 99% in the last 20 years, 90% in the last decade. You know, renewables are now the lowest cost source of new power generation in many, you know, in two thirds, in countries that represent two thirds of the global population. Um, you know, it's expected by the end of the decade that renewables will be the lowest cost source of new power generation, you know, across the entire globe. Um, you know, the industry has benefited from, uh, you know, more than 20 years of strong incentives, you know, from several places in the world, you know, that were leaders, you know, Germany, initially California, Ontario, uh, here in Canada, uh, and you know, and there was a time where renewables required uh, subsidization. But as a result of, you know, all that subsidization and all those investments uh, over the years, um, you know, R and D uh, improve. You know, improve, are there were R and D improvements, massive scale up in manufacturing, and now we're at the point where renewables are cost competitive. You know, with fossil fuels, uh, you know, without subsidies. You know, this is a really uh, profound change. You know, the narrative used to be that, you know, going green was costly, uh, but now it's also the lowest cost. We can have our cake and eat it too. We can uh, be clean and produce the, uh, the low cost energy that our modern world needs. Um, so to conclude, you know, the near term future, at least in, in my view, is not one of clean electrons or molecules only. Uh, you know, it's a changing mix. Um, the future will be much cleaner than it is today, but there will still be a role for fossil fuels for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, and a renewable future is made possible in part, at least, by you know, leveraging the wealth that's currently provided to us by the oil and gas industry and fossil fuels. Um, but you know, the age of renewables has arrived. The coming decade will see profound changes to the way in which we produce and consume our energy. Um, you know, and I'd appeal to, you know, for those that desire a clean future and protest future oil and gas development, uh, you know, I think it's important to remember that our current
prosperity, health, and technological advances were made possible you know, by the energy that's provided to us currently by fossil fuels. And also recognize that oil and gas will continue to have a role in our energy system for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, for those working in the oil and gas industry, you know, this is particularly acute here in Calgary, and, you know, and are denying the uh, advances in, in renewables. You know, I think it's really important to be aware of global trends uh, and embrace the future. You know, otherwise, I think we really run the risk of being left behind. Uh, I think it's important to recognize the facts that renewables are now extremely low cost and are poised for you know, massive growth uh, in the near term. Um, you know, ultimately, I believe uh, it's really important for us to move po uh, past polarization. I think we're much better off all working together. And uh, I believe the future can be clean and prosperous for all of us. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Dan, for that perspective, um, you know, an industry's perspective and somebody who's uh, kind of uh, recognized and embraced the challenge here. So we appreciate those thoughtful comments. Um, again, I'm just going to remind folks, if you do have questions, please do feed them in through the Zoom chat. We, we have some questions from our audience and uh, I'll get to those now. So I guess this one is for you, Michal. Um, are you at all thinking about or making progress on the matter of how we're going to deal with recycling of the batteries? Okay, so in my group, in my group we don't study recycling processes. And I think in general, in, in research, it's relatively a new topic. I think uh, that people gave started giving it attention in the past one or two years. Uh, but I can say that I, there are more and more research articles and work coming out on recycling. And there's also one research group here at Weizmann that has a new chemical process uh, that, is supposed to be, um, that is supposed to allow extracting the lithium from a used battery cell. So there is a lot of work on this. It's relatively a new, new direction. Now, this sounds very futuristic, Michal, but one more for you. Um, uh, you. Someone was very impressed with how you're applying MRI technology uh, to your research. And the question is, do you think actually what you're doing in the battery space uh, in that area, uh, in, in terms of how atoms and molecules work together, will have actually further application on humans? and perhaps applied to medical research? Does okay. it translate? Yeah, so it's a great question because actually the process was the inverse one. Uh, the, the way we do it actually started in biomedical applications. And um, so there was a, a method that was developed about uh, 15 years ago in order to increase the sensitivity and, what, and the detail that you can get um, on cancer tissues, for example. And I heard about that and I, <laughs> took it uh, to, the, uh, to my research direction, implemented this uh, methodology to understand how battery function. So actually it worked the other way around. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, this one's for you, uh, Mark. Um, so great, great presentation on your work uh, with algae, et cetera. Uh, I guess it's a bit of a, a comment and a question. You know, the, the person says that they think actually oil and gas uh, should be considered fossil fuels are in fact uh, biofuels prepared from nature using pressure and geothermal energy and stored underground. Um, and if you look, think about that, you can without disturbing land and the offshore um, and, and these kinds of resources are abundant and affordable. So I guess the thought is, on these conditions, if you apply carbon capture, sequestration, and storage to fossil fuels like this, uh, that will result in net zero emitters. Uh, biofuels, algae, etc., will need land and will these energy sources actually provide competitive energy to consumers. So a lot of a lot in that question, but I think they're actually asking because of 
how um, elaborate the needs are of your research, is it really a viable alternative to just CCS being applied to fossil fuels? That, that's the question, I believe. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. That's a great question. Uh, lots of questions in there. Um, I think probably the burning one, as, as I already said in the presentation, actually, no, I do not think uh, biofuels are uh, an economic, uh, economically feasible way and uh, you know, other feasibility ways. No, I don't think so. After, after researching it for quite a while, I, I am pessimistic about that. And that's why, as an investor, I would not invest in biofuels, but I would invest in renewables, like what Dan was talking about, right? I do think there's lots of uh, potential for, you know, growing things in like, you know, innovating food, et cetera, a lot of economic um, gains to be had, but it's not something that will replace uh, fossil fuels. In terms of um, fossil fuels and, and carbon sequestration and storage. So if you burn fossil fuels in a power plant where you have one stack, it can be a uh, net zero technology because then you can, can store it. I don't think it's going to be very often done simply because the renewals are already, even without the CCS, CCS out competing the fossil fuels for power. So you could do it, but probably not such a good idea. Fossil fuels can never be net zero for transport. And that's why we really need electrification of the, uh, of, of, you know, the, 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 um, the cars and, and, and it's happening. Even in Alberta, like every time it strikes me how many Teslas I see on the road, it's quite, quite striking really. Thanks. So I'll leave it at that. We can talk about the philosophical issue of the, of the biofuels and the fossil fuels another time. Yes, they are biofuels from the distant past. Okay, well, thanks very much for that, Mark. Michal, this one is a little perhaps difficult for you to relate to in Israel, but uh, it's probably highly relevant for, for us Canadians. Uh, do you think at all about whether current lithium battery technology would allow for ongoing power draw in cold northern climates for something as simple as, for example, LED lights? Yeah, so actually I never, I never thought about that. <laughs> and I think, so, I think in terms of them, so there is, batteries are very complex and there are also several ways to attack them. You know, so there's uh, aspects that are related to the materials and there are aspects that are related to the engineering of the cell, how you put the, assemble the battery pack together, what else do you have and what kind of control you have over the battery cell. So I think in terms of the materials level, which is what I'm working on, I doubt there will be a good solution because uh, currently you, you need something that it's chemical reaction and you need movement in a battery cell. You need the ions to be able to move. So definitely temperature works against that. And I don't think there are currently, there are materials that will be maybe less susceptible to the temperature, uh, but you will never get the same performance as you do uh, at the higher temperature or the Israeli climate. Um, but there are other solutions that are more engineering solutions. So you can have uh, ways to heat the system up either internally or externally. And I think probably solutions to that problem uh, will come from that direction. Thanks. If I might, one more for you, Michal, and then I'll yeah. have one or two for the other panelists before we wrap up. Um, so um, one question here is just in terms of your research, uh, Dr. Leskis, um, what do you see as the timeline for, for this to progress? And will it be soon enough to make a, a real difference given the challenging time frame yeah. of that's being kind of dictated by countries around the world for transition? Um, so I'm actually, I'm not, not talking specifically about the research in my group, but in general, the so many research groups working on these issues and they are well connected with the industry. So research now, especially on this kind of technologically relevant topics, and the movement from um, concepts, you know, from the concept in the lab to actual startups and companies that are uh, taking this up is quite quick. Um, so I, I am optimistic about this. Uh, and I think specifically what Weizmann is doing, which is really uh, useful is that they, they have a, a way to identify these ideas and immediately connect scientists with the company that, companies that are interested. 
uh, in this idea. So for example, we are connected to several car companies that are uh, continuously discussing with us whether they can implement some of the uh, materials that are developed uh, in the lab. So I, I mean, I don't have a number, I cannot say how many years, uh, but I think that uh, the system is really uh, responding fast to this. So everybody realizes that it's, a, it's really important. Thanks very much, Michal. Um, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the time. Uh, we did have some more questions that came in. Dan, you need to know there was a lot of interest in, in what you're doing. And, uh, you know, you know, just something that came out of that was that um, more a comment that, uh, uh, you know, Canada has historically been a real leader in the energy space. A lot of uh, companies have been financed here have done exceptional things and um, hoping, the message is hoping that we can very much remain, uh, Canada can, a destination of choice for companies and people with ideas when it comes to clean energy. So a lot of comments along those lines uh, for your benefit. Uh, uh, again, acutely aware of the time, I'd now like to turn it over to uh, uh, Beth Freeman, who's um, Regional Manager of Development for Western Canada for Weitzman. Uh, to close our session today. Over to you, Beth. I think you're on mute though. Oh, okay. Um, thanks again, Stan, for uh, moderating. Uh, that was great. And to Darlene also, who kicked us off the, earlier this morning. And also a, a big thank you to Mark and Michal and Dan uh, for sharing your work with us. It's so, so that was very informative and I'm sure we could talk about this all morning. Um, I think everybody will have some great takeaways from your presentations, uh, which just provided more food for thought when it comes to the uh, future of clean energy. I also wanna thank all of you um, who joined us for choosing to spend the last 60 minutes with us and, and asking such great questions. I appreciate that you made the time to further your thinking with us on clean energy and hearing about the research going on at Weizmann, University of Calgary, and in industry through uh, Greengate Power. Uh, the Weizmann campus in Israel is characterized by the joy and pursuit of science, some of which you heard of today. Uh, there's a multidisciplinary approach and an openness to share knowledge and embrace new ideas. Uh, the Weizmann model enables scientists to be curious and offers the freedom for boundless creativity. And the model has also uh, included many global collaborations, uh, some of which you heard about today, uh, the Canadian ones that uh, Darlene mentioned earlier. These last 16 months have been a very long science lesson. And one thing the world has learned is the importance of basic scientific research. At Weizmann Canada, we invest, in recognize, we invest in discovery and recognize that with time, space, and resources, the scientists at Weizmann put hope in action and make a global impact. We are driven by the purpose of science to develop new knowledge and improve the world. It is my pleasure to, and passion to talk about Weizmann, and so if you are interested in finding out more or joining us, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to chat with you. My uh, email address is beth at weitzman.ca. And I hope you will share some of the wows from today's talk with others. And please feel free to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about the research and discoveries. Thank you all again and have a wonderful day. It is uh, 8.59 in Mountain Time. So one minute to go. Uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. <laughs>